Good evening. Good evening. Let's all turn to page 147. I, I'm going to catch myself. I said, but I have to remember. We've got songbooks now. Page 147. Let's all stand. We'll sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs> Uh, and then they'll be, they, they, they'll do 
one procedure the, 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 to get ready for the surgery, and then they'll do something else. They'll do the part of the back surgery, then they'll let him, uh, they'll check, make sure all that went well, then they'll do some more. So that was just a, a long process that he's, he'll be uh, involved in over the next week. Uh, and then the doctors are saying it's going to take a good three months for him to, to get over all this. Uh, so you pray for Brother Bruce. I know he'd appreciate that. Uh, pray for Miss Opal uh, while she tries to take care of Brother Bruce. <laughs> Amen. Uh, he, he's a lot like me. He's going to be a handful. Uh, so I, I would not envy my wife uh, trying to have to take care of me like that. But anyway, uh, so you pray for Brother Bruce. Pray for Brother Marvin Graham. As far as I know, everything is going well with him. Uh, I believe the last thing I saw Miss Lisa uh, comment on was that he, he, he thinks he's 100%. So you pray for them. Uh, I know, again, I know they appreciate that. Several others that are on our prayer list. Uh, I do remember Brother uh, uh, Marvin Ramage. Pray for him as he recovers from his uh, a four wheeler accident. Pray for him. I understand Brother Dale got at least a, re a reply from one of the doctors. Uh, they're saying, what, uh, eight, seven to eight days before they get back with him again. So uh, you pray for him that all that goes well. Pray for Brother Allgood. Uh, Miss Robin's been sick. Pray for Brother Larry uh, with his knee. Uh, Brother Steve Clark, it was good to see him Sunday, but you continue to pray for him uh, as well. Brother Mickey, uh, Miss Barbara, uh, Miss Dana, uh, Miss Glenda, uh, uh, Brother Richard, Miss Glenda Johnson. Uh, pray for Scott. Scott has started running a fever yesterday, uh, so they took him to the doctor today, and he has uh, uh, an ear infection. They did test him for COVID, so we'll find out in a few days, and that's why they're not here tonight. Um, so you know, we'll find out in a few days about that test, but you pray for uh, Brother Scott. They, they, they said that, that they were very, they would be very, very surprised if it was anything other than that, than that ear infection, that he had a pretty pretty bad infected ear. So pray for him. Uh, I know they'd appreciate that. Uh, I got a good, uh, a good, I had a good chat with Brother Adam Spaulding uh, just before church. Uh, they were on their way back from a pulmonary appointment with Brody, uh, and they were very, very pleased with, with his appointment. Uh, he has he has gained 12 pounds and grew three inches uh, uh, in the last 11 months. So he's tickled to death. Uh, and uh, but the doctor was really pleased with with where he is with, with his lungs. They were uh, excited about the progress that he's made. So they're uh, releasing or, 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 or relaxing some of the restrictions on him uh, and, and that they had placed as far as being able to get out and be around folks and. Uh, all the different things there. So you pray uh, for them. Pray for Miss Brittany. She has an appointment next week with uh, the dental work one more time. So pray for her. Uh, Brother uh, Adam's grandmother, uh, Miss Mildred Owsley, uh, pray for her. She is, uh, they're moving her to an in-house rehab there at the hospital. So that's a step up. Uh, so we're thankful for that as well. And then there are others on our prayer list. Do remember Miss Clara King. Continue to remember her. Uh, in your prayers, that's Miss uh, Aaron, our daughter-in-law, that's her mother. Uh, do remember the Matthews family, continue to remember them uh, in your prayers. And then there are a couple others that we wanted to mention. Um, uh, Miss Dez asked that we remember her family uh, out, in, out west uh, by all the, the fires. I believe as of this morning, could have changed since then, but as of this morning, I believe she was saying most of the family is out of the dang immediate danger zone. Uh, they still had a cabin that was that was possibly uh, still in danger. So, uh, but you pray for them. Uh, pray for Miss Cassidy Gilbert. This is the, uh, uh, the our teenagers, the Mays. This is their boss where they work uh, at uh, Dairy Queen. Uh, she lost a set of twins. Uh, so do remember Miss Cassie Cassidy Gilbert. I do remember her uh, in your prayers. The Trent family, the Mays, asked for prayer, prayer for them. Uh, the McCoys asked that we remember Miss Kristen Dye. Uh, Miss Kristen Dye is a friend of Michaela, uh, of uh, Michaela, of Kayla's uh, that uh, was in a car accident this past week. And I, I saw a picture of the, of the Suburban that she was driving, uh, and it, it tore that thing up pretty bad. It's a uh, surprise that she wasn't hurt any more than she is. She's not serious, but you pray for her. Uh, I know they would appreciate that as well. So just many, many uh, prayer requests and things that we need to remember uh, to pray for. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dallas has got their criminal class. 
Us is on, is on Friday. All right, anyone else? Well, I do remember to pray for our church that as we continue to seek the Lord and just uh, allow the Lord to work and, and give us direction through all of the, uh, the things that we're facing. And, and as we continue to are allowed to open up, we'll, we'll just seek the Lord and, and do what we can as we can uh, and trust the Lord along the way. All right, any other prayer requests? All right, if not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are so thankful for the day that you've given us. Father, this list that we've talked about today is, is, is extensive. It just seems like on every hand we look around, almost every family in our church has been touched by something. Father, I pray that you will have your hand on each one of us, that you will give grace and strength, that as we focus our hearts and minds on you, that we understand and that we know that you have all things in your hand. We understand that the sun rises and sets at your command. Father, we thank you for the grace that you've shown in our lives. How so many times and so often you've met with us. And you've moved in our lives and you've moved in our hearts. Father, I pray that you'll just continue to make yourself very real to us. Father, I pray that you'll meet needs and families, that you'll show up and do things that no one else can do. Father, I pray for healing, pray for grace, pray for strength, pray for encouragement. Father, I pray that you'll just continue to work, that you will give us the wisdom to wait and watch and serve you as you lead us. Father, I pray for the services tonight that all would be done for your honor and your glory, that you'd speak to our hearts and minds tonight, that you would uplift us, draw us closer to you. We love you. We're thankful for your mercies, thankful for your hand, and thankful for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, do remember our prayer, our, our uh, missionaries. I think, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot now. All right, so now she came back out. I think Miss Katie is going to start trying to put out a, uh, with our prayer le uh, list, uh, a weekly, uh, the weekly, the weekly, the weekly, all right, uh, a, a weekly missionary uh, of the week. Uh, so a little write-up about them, what's going on uh, on their field and that, that kind of thing. Uh, so next week, look for that, or maybe the week after that, we'll give her a couple of weeks to get started. Uh, but she mentioned that today, so I uh, do remember all of our missionaries it looks like a number of them are, are getting back to the point to where they're getting close to the field. I have not looked closely at the prayer letter. I got one today from, from Brother Dye, uh, and it looks like they're about to get ready to go back to Papua New Guinea. Uh, Brother Anderson is, is poised uh, to get back to, to Mexico City. Uh, and so several uh, that really things are, are about in place where they can get back to uh, where the Lord has called them. So. Pray for our missionaries. Uh, looking forward to next month. I can't wait uh, just to be involved in seeing a few missionaries and visiting with them throughout the month next month. All right. Uh, grab a songbook. Hey, man, I'm going to say There you go. Grab a songbook. We're going to lift our voices in song. I went to Lowe's today, and they're already putting out their Christmas stuff. I'm sorry. I had to think about it. I said, wait a minute. I have, we haven't had Thanksgiving yet, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I know we haven't had Thanksgiving. Well, they skip, they skip Halloween goes straight to Thanksgiving. Yeah, I can't, I can't believe it. All right, well, you can remain seated. Let's turn to page 351. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses of Tell It to Jesus.
turn to page 288. Let's sing, I am resolved. Thinking very diligently. 
the hid treasure. Yeah. Amen. The treasure that was hid in the field. And if you remember last week, we talked about this as a perspective uh, from Jesus' perspective. And we talked about the, the, the nation of Israel. Uh, now remember in Matthew 13, the first four parables Jesus taught outside. Uh, he taught to the multitudes. We learned last week that he talked to those that walked by sight. And they were men of sight. Uh, and Jesus was teaching them. And he was dealing with how the devil is going to, if you'll pardon this, uh, this phrase, how the devil was just going to have a heyday uh, in this time period. Uh, how the devil would be moving and working. And we looked at, if you look at all four of those parables, the sower, uh, the, the tares, the mustard seed, and the leaven, uh, you can see that's just a description of how the devil is going to be after or working against the kingdom of heaven uh, from the time uh, that Christ came uh, to the time that he returns and this, this time we call the church age. When he moves indoors and he goes, he dismisses the multitude. And last week we found out that he, that he went into the house and he began to teach just his disciples. Now he changes uh, his viewpoint. Now when he goes inside, he begins to teach uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven from God's perspective. And last week we learned how he talked about his perspective in dealing with the children of Israel. Uh, that treasure hid in the field, how he, the, the, uh, the, it was found, uh, and then it was hidden again, uh, and, and how that paralleled the nation of Israel. Now, as we move forward, again, we're going to talk about this pair, or this second parable. It goes with last week. It's the, par the parable of the pearl of great price. We're going to turn our attention this week, instead of Israel, now we're going to turn our attention to the Gentiles, and more specifically, we're going to turn our attention to the working of the church in this age. Now we call this the age of grace, or some folks will call this the church age. Uh, this time that the church began at the beginning of this age, uh, and then toward the end of this age, the church will be called out. Uh, we will meet the Lord in the air. Uh, and I've said this a long time. I, a lot of folks, uh, I, I've discussed with a number of people uh, about this theory or this idea of a universal church. I believe that one day it will be a universal church, but it's when all of us are called up together to meet the Lord in the air, and then we're all together with Him, and we will be one big church. Until then, we see a biblical example uh, uh, of individual, local, autonomous New Testament churches on the earth working as God leads us. So I want to be very careful as we go through this parable that we not give you the, the inclination or, or, or lead you in a, a direction that, that, that you think I'm talking about a, a universal church. That I, that's not what I'm talking about when we go through this parable. And you'll understand what I mean when I get there, okay? I, I am a local church guy. I believe God works through his local New Testament church. I, I think you need to be a member of a local New Testament church. I think we need to have a pastor. Uh, we need to have the headship of Christ over us. Uh, and, and all the way, and I'm, I'm not preaching on the local church tonight, but, uh, but I just I, I want to make sure I said that before we could, because if we don't, uh, there, there's some difficulties here if we, if we allow them to come up. All right. So my question tonight to get us started is going to be this. Then we're going to jump right into the parable of the Pearl of Great Price. My, my question is this, are we functioning? Are we functioning as Christ intended his church to function? Last week we talked about how God chose Israel. He called them and because of their compromise, he hid them, right? He cut off the natural branch and he grafted in the the. the uh, the, the wild olive branch, I, I was going to say unnatural, but that wasn't the right word. Uh, the, the wild olive branch, he, he grafted that, which is the, the Gentiles and the church age. So as that transition is made and now we're functioning as Christ called his church to function, are we doing that? Are we serving him like he designed for us to do? And the warning here is this. There came a point in time because Israel would not function the way they were supposed to that he cut Israel off. And I read 
the scriptures. Now, it's not mine to say when this would happen, but I do read the scriptures that there can come a point in time that if a church is not doing what they're supposed to do, that God can remove the candlestick. Right. I mean, John, he, he laid the foundation, the groundwork with Israel and showed us what he can do. Thank God for grace. Amen. All right, so if you look at verse 45 and verse 46 of our text, you'll, you'll, you'll see this parable uh, of the pearl of great price. Look at it. It says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father, again, we are thankful for the reading of your word. Pray that you'll help us tonight. Help us to not be so overwhelmed by all the other stuff. We'll just simply settle in, listen to your word, let your spirit deal with our hearts. Father, I pray that you'll help us answer that challenge. Are we functioning like a New Testament church should? Father, I do pray that you'll just continue to lead God and direct us. Give us exactly what we stand in need of tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, to, to go along and kind of kind of go with the, the parable we did last week, we're going to approach it about the same, the same way. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the participants. Uh, we'll kind of nail down some of these, who these folks are and, and what's going on here. And then we'll talk about heaven is likened to a merchant man. So the kingdom of heaven has been the kingdom of heaven, has been the kingdom of heaven since we started Matthew chapter 13. Uh, it's from the time that Christ came to the time that he comes back. It's the working of God in this time period, okay? So he talks about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about this, this age that we're dealing with that we're in. All right. He, he goes on here in, in verse 45 and says that the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Now, as we go through all of these parables so far... Uh, everybody, every man that we've seen in these parables thus far, the sower, uh, we saw it represented Christ. Uh, and, and we could go through and we could talk about each one. And, and, and every time there was, there was a representative of Christ in these parables. This was no different. We find here the merchant man uh, is going to represent or is going to picture Jesus Christ. And how do we know that, preacher? Well, we know that by getting down to the latter part of this parable where it says that he went out and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, uh, we're, we're not talking about, remember, this is a parable and we're not, we're not uh, trying to take it literally, but what we're saying is the principle here uh, that he gave his all for that one pearl of great price. I was getting way ahead of myself, so I'm not going to do it. But uh, if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, I don't think it's very difficult to find out who we're talking about uh, and this idea uh, of giving himself, right? So we see the merchant man representing Christ. The goodly pearls, there, there's a difference here. There are goodly pearls, and then there's one pearl of great price. There, there's some discussion on what these two mean. But I think the, the best thing that I read and I looked at and, and I thought about this this week, uh, about this, this parable, the goodly pearls uh, to me represent the sinner that's being sought by Christ. Well, how can a sinner be good? It, no, it's not that they're intrinsically good. It's not that anything good about them, uh, but it's that God is seeking them. That's what makes it good. Right? So he's seeking these pearls. He, he's out trying to seek and to find. Uh, because what did Jesus. I get way ahead of myself. Why did you, no, I can't do that. I'll, I'll save that for, this, for, for the next point. All right? Now, and then we find that one pearl of great price. Again, there's some debate on this, but I think if you put as we go through this and you see all this coming together, I think what you're going to see that one pearl is going to represent the church. And here's where we kind of will get into a difficulty if we're not careful. I'm going to use that phrase. I'm going to talk about the church. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about the Catholic church or the Baptist church or the Episcopal church. Or, or I'm not talking about that kind of church. I, I, I'm talking about, number one, in this time frame, I'm talking about each individual local New Testament church that one day will be called together, meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be that one 
body and church in heaven with Christ. So we'll see that phrase, the church, you'll hear that, but don't be confused. And we find out, like the last part of this, we talk about the pearl of great price, then we see the purchase. The purchase. We see the purchase price. Said that in verse number 46, sold all that he had. Then we find that we find the action there. He bought it. So as we see the players involved in this parable, let me now give you the explanation so we can kind of understand some things and see, see why I put it together the way that I did. Now, uh, I understand there'll be some folks that may disagree with kind of the way I put it together, and that's fine. I, I'm okay with that. I, I, I'm big enough to understand that, uh, that maybe I don't get it right all the time, but, uh, you know, but if you don't want to agree, that's okay. You can be wrong if you want to. That's, that's all right with me, but... It's a joke right there. You can smile. All right. Uh, so as we go forward with the explanation, let's, let's talk about this, number one. As we begin to see this parable, it said this, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Can we not understand that that merchant man being Christ, that is speaking of the, the fact that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came seeking those whom he loves. He comes seeking those who have value. Why? Because he said they have value. Not because they have any righteousness of their own. Not because they have anything of their own to, to, to boast about or be proud of. But because God loves them and God's seeking them and God wants to meet their need. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19 verse number 10 that Jesus came for that purpose. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. We find a merchant man here. The picture is that this merchant man is doing everything that he can to purchase unto himself those who are lost in sin. I'm told, and I'm not a scholar by any sense of the imagination, but I'm told that that word merchant means not like a retailer, but like a wholesaler. And what I mean by that, it's not someone that, that sells for themselves. It's someone that is enabling someone else. It's, it's someone that's, that's seeking something else and, and he's purchasing that for someone else. He's redeeming. Listen, it's a picture of Jesus Christ who is redeeming mankind unto himself, unto God. He is that, that go-between. He is that, uh, that arbitrator. He, he is that one that goes between us and God. He is our high priest. We find, first of all, the explanation of this, that Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. We see a merchantman that has is, that is dedicated his life. He's, he's given everything that he has to seeking that goodly pearl, to seeking that merchandise uh, that, he, that he so desires. And Christ came that he might save sinners of whom I am chief. And then we find, second of all, not only Christ came to seek and to save, but as we look at this parable, we find the second thing that Christ's plan, Christ's plan was to organize his church. When Christ came to this earth, he came for one purpose, yes, to seek and to save that which was lost. He, he came to purchase mankind's redemption. He, he came to give himself a ransom for all. That, but listen, as he was on the seashores of, of Galilee that day, and he called his disciples unto him, it wasn't just an afterthought one day that he went... Hey, you know what I'll do? I'll think I'll start me a church. No, it was the plan of God uh, that as he understood that Israel would be moving away from him, that he would call this church unto himself and he would set this church as his trophy of grace to, to those in that church age. He had a plan set before the foundation of the world uh, that he would seek and to save the lost and bring them into this thing called the local New Testament church for his service, for his honor and his glory. Matthew chapter 16, we, we find that statement Jesus talks about, upon this rock I will build my church. Again, it wasn't an afterthought. We're standing in this place today because before the foundations of the world, God looked through time and he saw Gilbertsville, Kentucky, and he said, I'm going to plant a church there uh, that, that I can work through and I can use them that we might reach the lost with the gospel. God had a perfect plan and he's 
still has that plan and he's still working that plan today. Amen. We find in this parable, he finds this one pearl, a great price. Then it says this. Sold all that he had. Bought it. I, I wrote these four little words down in my notes. And if I stand here and look at them, I, I think they're four simple little words. Oh, the volumes that they speak. It simply says this Christ. Completed his purpose. He completed. Aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad, as the song says, he didn't call 10,000 angels to deliver him from the cross, to set him free. No, he died alone for you and me. Aren't you glad he completed the purpose that he came? He completed the job, the duties that God had laid out before him. He came to seek and save. He came to give himself the, a ransom for many. He, he came for all that, that, that would receive. He, he came that we could have Christ as our Savior. He came to establish his New Testament church. That throughout this age, there'd be a place. There'd be a place where people would gather, not to just talk about the weather, not to just talk about prideful things, not to sit around and do things that other clubs do. There would be a place where people would come together with the same thought, the same heart, and the same desire as Christ to seek and to save that. To be a lighthouse in a community. To be a hospital for those who are hurting. You might reach them. What a sacrifice. Christ paid. Christ completed his purpose. Take your Bible. Go to the book of Acts. Chapter number one. Acts chapter number one. Preacher, how do you know? How do you know that that purpose was completed. Well, I'm glad you asked. We don't have time to, to deal with all of it, but I, I just want to give you something very, very simple. Acts chapter number one. And you understand Acts chapter number one starts this, what we call the Acts of the Apostles. We understand that the book of Acts is the story of the New Testament church as it goes forward. We understand that Acts starts with the New Testament church and ends with gives us great detail throughout the, the book of Acts about the local church. It says in Acts chapter number 1, look at verse number 12. After Christ had risen, ascended back to the Father. The Bible says this, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about an hundred. And we can continue reading what happened there, but, but I think you can get the gist already. Here's what happened. They went, they watched Jesus go into the clouds. He, he gave them that commandment, that commission. They go back to Jerusalem. They meet together. 120 are meeting there. What does it sound like they're doing there in that upper room? I think they're having a church service there. Uh, that's what he said when it talked about co continuing with one accord in prayer and, suppl and supplication. And, and he talked about the 120 that were gathered together there. Listen, we're talking about 
not the constitution uh, 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 or, or the meaning of what was constituted by Christ as his local New Testament church. We find he committed, he completed the, the purpose that God gave him in saving souls by dying on the cross and then by instituting his church and giving that soul saving station that the world so desperately needs today. We see this simple parable of a pearl of great price. Oh, what a testimony of what Christ has done. Oh, what a testimony of the legacy that he has left us. We might be called Christians, as they were in Antioch. That we might, as they said of the apostles, these men that have turned the world upside down. Small little parable. This pearl of great price has great value to the Lord, has a great calling here in this world. Preacher, how do you know, how do you know it has a great value unto the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked that. We'll get to the last point. The last point is the application. We know, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, and then we're going to back up. We know it has great value. My Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 5 that he loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, now preacher, I, I don't, you know, I, I understand the fact that Jesus died to save sinners. I get that part, but I'm not sure I understand that church thing. Well, Ephesians chapter number 5 tells us very clearly that yes, while Jesus died to save sinners, and that was his focus, and that's what he came to do, but he also, as he died on the cross and shed that blood, it was for his local New Testament church as well. That it would be the gathering place. It would be uh, the place where we would come together for encouragement and excitement and, and and, and our marching orders to go forward as Christ leads us. We'll understand what the church really is. And how we play such a integral part in God's local body. I really think it would jog our understanding in our commitment. Let me give you four things real quick about the application of this parable and we'll be done with it. Number one, take your Bible and go to Mark chapter number two. Mark chapter number two. We're going to find first of all, and, and I think this goes, as we understand what a church is all about, and, and don't get me wrong, I, 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 have, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could tell you this in, in a way that you would understand what I mean by this. When I first went to seminary and I first started, started seeking the Lord in the direction of, of, of pastoring a church, one of my dreams, one of my goals, one of the things that I had prayed about from, from I went to seminary, don't listen to this, I went to seminary in, in 1993. I moved to seminary. We moved to seminary. <laughs> Five years, I was there for five years, got out in 98. Began pastoring churches while I, while I was in seminary. In 1994, I started pastoring my first little church. Well, that was a blessing. That was a fun place. The little church, the little church sat right across the street from a paper mill. If you've never smelled a paper, paper mill, you've never lived. And I'm saying this church, I'm, I'm not kidding. It was directly across the street. Mm. My, my, I don't think my wife ever got used to it. Every time we, she'd come out of church, she'd say, oh, that smells awful. And I, I'd always pick it. I'd always say, it smells like money to me. <laughs> and the little church, was, it was a small little, it was struggling. And, and we, well, we, we were there for a year and a half. And then we, you know, and just different things, small churches and and trying to trying to serve the Lord and do what God wants to do, and I'm I, and I'm not, I don't I'm trying not to say this wrong, okay? But I pray, I, I pray, God, if, if I could have, if if I could pastor the church that that would be my dream church, 
as far as facility wise, it looked a lot like this. I, I can't tell you. First time I walked in this building. And I don't, don't get me wrong, the building had nothing to do with me coming here, but I walked in, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I walked in and I thought, oh Lord, I could like this. <laughs> Please? <laughs> Please? <laughs> Why? Because, because, I mean, I've been in some churches where, and I've pastored some churches that, that it's rough. And I, I can tell you some stories. I can tell you stories of meeting in a National Guard armory for, for six weeks. Where we had to go every Sunday morning, we had to go clean up from the beer party the night before just so we could get in the front door to have church. My daughter's got a scar from falling off on the concrete uh, in, in that room. One, one of the two. <laughs> uh, one, one of the other little girls that, that, that was a member of our, our church, or her family, members of our church, had busted her head open and, 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 you know, in the same place. I just, it was a rough place. And I, I don't want to go through all those stories and all that stuff, but I remember walking in here the first time. And I, and I remember thinking, oh, Lord, I can like this. You know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I thought, I thought to myself, and I, I'll say this, it's been two years, I guess I can say this now, I walked in and I thought, oh Lord, I hope there's a good church in this building. I, I, I found out there is. But here, here's what we need to understand. Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus said this, when Jesus heard, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician." They that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, we, we've gotten to a place to where we're pretty comfortable. We were talking about thermostats so what, just a while ago. We come in and we sit on nice padded pews and we have a very nice building. You understand that that has nothing to do with church. And, and if we get to the place, see, here, here's the thing. We need to understand, first of all, that the church was formed from a lowly origin. Jesus called the unlaid right. unto salvation. Jesus, Jesus didn't call the righteous called sinners to repentance. And, and I think I think we as the local church will do well to remember where we came from. Because all of us if you're part of the expression, all of us came from the wrong side of the tracks. All of us have baggage that we really would like for it to stay in the problem. We're not careful. We can forget what God has done for us and brought us to this place. We'll forget about the time when someone knocked on our door and we tried to be quiet so they couldn't hear us. So maybe they'd go away. Someone tried to share the gospel with us and we wouldn't listen. Pearl of great price speaks of a church. God paid the ultimate price for. Sometimes, somehow, I think that we forget. We get enamored. The carpet on the floor, the paint on the walls. And we forget. This is just a facility right. that houses the church of God. Yeah. And we have a responsibility. And we have a duty. Number two, I, I think also we find this application from this parable. Uh, that not only was it formed from a lowly origin, number two, it was formed slowly and gradually. Uh, if you go back and you 
start looking at the parallel between the plural uh, and, and the, the growth of the church, you'll find out you can make this application or this illustration how that, that plural is formed, number one, because of an irritant. You understand how that pearl is made, how that oyster makes that pearl. It gets a grain of sand or something gets into that pearl that's irritating that pearl. It's a problem for that pearl and that, 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 that oyster. And that oyster begins to secrete that, uh, that, that solution that coats that problem and it, and it builds up over time and creates this pearl. We need to understand that the church of God, uh, while he instituted his church and he started it on the spot, uh, but the, the, our church is a, is a process of, of slow growth and gradual growth. We, we need to understand, we need to watch where we are, and we need to focus what's going on in our own life and understand that God's slowly growing us to the place that He wants us to be. And if we're not growing, listen, if we're not growing, we're not meeting the purpose that God has set for us. You, you do understand that if God was finished growing you, that He'd take you home to be with Him. When we are perfect, we'll see him face to face. But until that day, he's going to continually work on us, grow us, and improve us to be more and more like him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 talks about this idea of growing in grace. Number three, not only was it formed from a lowly origin, not only was it formed slowly and gradually, but we find this, that it was formed through suffering and death. Through suffering. And death. Ephesians chapter 5, we talked about this a while ago. Verse 25 talks about the fact that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And we're just going through church history. And how many times, and I know we didn't stop and do a lot of this just for sake of time, but you could go back and you could see how many hundreds, probably even thousands of folks that have given their life for what they stood for and what they believed in. The church has, has been grown and it has been built upon suffering and death. And then we get a little bit of hardship. We get a governor that starts talking about how we should meet. We think we have the worst persecution we've ever seen. What are we going to do? Well, you know, they weren't lined up to shoot us when we walked in. If the church was formed through suffering death, through suffering and death, why do we think that it's going to be a cakewalk? It's going to be easy. No, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to do the things that God's called us to do. If it was easy, he wouldn't have needed to call a church. To set himself within it. And finally, it's going to finish with an honorable future. You do understand that one day, one day, how, how's it, how, how does the song put it? One day it will be worth it all. I stand before my Savior and I see him face to face. You do realize that when we get to heaven, everything that we think that we have suffered, every sacrifice that we think we have made, every difficulty that we think we've gone through, we stand before him and see him face to face, will not even be a memory as we remember what he's done. Bible, the last verse, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I hope that you have seen the parallel of this pearl of great price. Its last application was from the formation of that pearl a picture of the growth of the local New Testament church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2, the Bible says this. For I am jealous. We'll go back to verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Would to God ye would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. 
For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. That I may present you as a chaste virgin. Because the church finishes in the knowledge of Jesus. One day, one day we'll receive the marriage supper of the Lamb. One day, we will recognize or we will realize what it means to be the bride of Christ. All of this. All of this will be forgotten. Yeah. But there's something that happens. Something that happens between now and Supper of the Lamb that we need not forget. There's a small little thing called the judgment seat of Christ. Where before we get to sit down at that marriage supper, we will give an account for what we've done. As the pearl of great price. We will give an account as the church of God. What we have done with the sacrifice that Christ made to purchase his bride. So I'll go back to my question and I'm done. Are we functioning as Christ intended his church? Are we serving him as he desires us to serve him? He, pray, he paid a great price. He saw value in us. Are we returning? see these two parables that compare them. Parable of the hidden treasure that is found and yet hidden again. The parable of the pearl of great price. It doesn't say in this parable that it was hidden. Let's be God's cruel workers. Let's show the world there is a God, and He's still on the throne, and He's still blessing His people. Father, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it is to be in your house. I pray that you'll help us tonight. Help us as we act upon the truths that we've seen tonight. Draw us closer to you. Uplift us. Help us as we seek to serve you. We love you. Thank you for your grace and your mercies towards us in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Ooh. We'll have a verse of invitation. If you need to come, the altars are open.